Okay, so I think there is plenty of us here, so we can start. Uh, welcome here, everybody, in the spaces of Anglo American University in Prague. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are Students for Liberty. We are an international organization of students dedicated to spreading the ideas of liberty, or in this case, the underlying ideas behind it. And we are here today to talk about equality and inequality and and uh, what the what the fair or the what the just approach is to, to wealth distribution and income distribution. Uh, we are here today to talk about it with Jaron Brook, uh, the chairman of the board of the Emma Institute, the host of the Jaron Brook show that you can follow on YouTube and I believe Facebook as well. And uh, the author of books that you can see in the atrium, uh, I believe we have all three of them. I think we have okay. Equal is Unfair in Pursuit of Wealth, and we have also Free Market Revolution, as well as the SFL Students for Liberty t shirts, Free Market Revolution, that are unconnected but they are nice and you can take them as well. They stole the name from. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that topic, uh, we also have books available in the foyer, courtesy of the AMN Institute, that you can take for free. Uh, but uh, because we are a volunteering organization, uh, our organization and all our events are free, uh, they don't, they, 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 they still have costs, and we appreciate if you if you donate anything you can so that we can keep these events running. And similarly, if you prefer to read a check. Uh, there are also some books, uh, uh, some, some Czech translations of Enrin's book uh, that you can talk to Yuri Kinkor over there about. Uh, those are unfortunately not for free, those are for sale, but I'm sure if you are, if you are you know, uh, in the capitalist spirit here, then you won't mind. And I believe that's all from me about the introductions. Uh, don't forget to follow Students for Liberty on Students for Liberty CZ, to be precise, on Facebook if you don't already do so, because this is the first of our uh, events that we do every semester, so you can you can expect these to go on every every two weeks in, uh, on Wednesdays in Prague, and this semester I believe on Tuesdays in, in Brnov, and potentially in some other cities as well this semester. So I look forward to seeing many of you there in the future. And that's all from me and on to you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to move this out of the way. I should have done it earlier. There we go. That's good. Uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you for, I know many of you follow me on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube and my, uh, my show. Those of you who don't, please do. Um, I, I produce a lot of content, so even if you consume just a little bit of it, that would be great. Uh, thank you to Students for Liberty for hosting me. Um, I, I, I'm always happy to be back in, uh, in Prague. I don't know what number talk this is in Prague, but uh, I've, I've been doing this for a long time uh, and, and been coming here for a long time, so it's always, uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, I, I do want to mention that you've got two flyers in front of you, just quickly. Um, these are primarily for students. Uh, if you are a student, you can get a free copy of Ayn Rand's books by uh, scanning this, um, and uh, you get to choose a book, and it'll digitally download onto whatever device you're using. So uh, you can get free copies of any of her fiction or nonfiction books. They're, they're available. Please take advantage of it. One of my goals is to get people to read Ayn Rand. That's what it's all about. And then also if you're students, um, but also if you're not a student, uh, we're having a conference in Athens, which is pretty cool, uh, which is uh, on Ayn Rand's ideas, but it also will involve some um, experts in Greek philosophy, so it'll be a combination of things. It is happening in April. It'll be a lot of fun. If you're a student and you scan this, you can apply for a scholarship and basically go there for free, right? They'll cover your travel expenses and the whole thing. Just write a nice explanation for why you want it. But you have to do it now because the scholarships are only available for the next two uh, week or so, and then uh, they're done. Uh, but students can go to this for free. Those of you who are not students, you guys can pay and go because I, I know you guys in the Czech make a good living, and there's no reason why you can't go to Athens, partially vacation, part intellectual exploration. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So um, um, 
I encourage, I encourage you to do both of those. So we're going to talk today about uh, you know the problem, uh, the problem of inequality, and you know these days, um, it seems like inequality is now ingrained in people as one of the problems that exist out there in the world. Uh, I remember you know 10, 12 years ago, almost nobody talked about inequality. It really wasn't in the vocabulary as a regular thing that people discussed uh, as a problem with freedom, a problem with capitalism, a problem with Western economies, however you want to define them. Uh, you know, there was a, I think financial crisis was a turning point, and it started becoming a real part of the vocabulary, and it really took off when uh, Thomas Piketty uh, published his uh, Das Kapital for the 21st century, um, I, you know, which, I, that's the name, right, capital in the 21st century, um, and uh, he became an instant celebrity and a potential nominee for a, 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 a Nobel Prize in economics and maybe the most influential economist over the last 10 years. And it became almost as a flood in the United States and all over the world, really. I've been to Asia, I've been everywhere. People started just to talk about inequality and everything was blamed on inequality. Terrorism was the fault of inequality, war is the fault of inequality. Uh, climate change is, of course, the fault of inequality and the consequences. The real problem with the consequences, it doesn't hurt people the same, so it, it perpetuates inequalities. It seems that like this idea that things aren't equal has become a rallying call of the left. And, and the problem is that what I find is on the right, what you see is people apologizing for it. Oh, no, no, Rand Paul in, uh, in the d debates, in the presidential debates, I think in 2016, Rand Paul's response was, in capitalism, we have less inequality. So if we really had free markets, this wouldn't be a problem. So acknowledging that it's a problem, and then saying, in capitalism, we'll have less of it. First, let me say, you really would have less inequality? I'm dubious. I don't know how much inequality we have in capitalism. How much inequality should we have in capitalism? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Somebody said seven. I think that's the right answer. Absolutely. Seven. <laughs> the reality is that in capitalism, we should have as much inequality as happens. <laughs> as happens. I don't know if it's more. I don't know if it's less. Who the F cares? So the right has been way too apologetic about the issue acknowledging it's a problem, recognizing it's a problem, saying we have a solution, markets solve it. I'm skeptical, put it that way. But the real skepticism is, is it a problem? What is the problem of inequality? Why is it a problem? Why should we care or should we care about this question of inequality? And you know, from an economic perspective, I don't know how many economists there are here, students of economics, from a purely economic perspective, does anybody care about e inequality? I mean, Piketty has this theory that, uh, that the return of capital grows faster than the economy forever, and therefore all the capital accumulates in the hands of just a few, and everybody else becomes destitute, right, dirt poor because the return of capital has grown faster than wages and faster than any other thing that happens in the economy. Uh, who else had the same exact theory? Original capital? Uh, yeah, original das Kapital, right? Mark, Karl Marx had exactly the same theory. Never happened, can happen. If you understand anything about economics, you know that just on a purely economic perspective, marginal return on capital is going to decline over time. It doesn't accelerate over time. And you can grow capital faster than the economy. It just doesn't make any sense. What is capital going into? The economy. So the whole economic structure of the argument against inequality is, why does it matter? So one of the arguments they make uh, you know, uh, is, look, the problem with inequality is that rich guys get a lot of money. And what do rich people do with their money? What do rich people do with their money? They sit on it, they hoard it, right? They don't do anything with their money. And if you took that money from rich people and you gave it to poor people, what would they do with it? 
They would spend it, they would consume it, and what is the thing that drives the economy? Consumption, spending. And therefore, what we want to do to drive economics is get all that rich money into the hands of poor people because the rate of consumption is higher. Rich people don't consume their money. That's the problem. That's what we're told. I mean, how many yachts can you have? How many private airplanes? A billionaires can't spend billions, right? So they don't spend their money. Now, what does hoarding mean in a modern society? I mean, what are they really doing? Do you, do you have Scrooge McDuck? Did you ever see Scrooge McDuck in... in, in, in uh, Remember Scrooge McDuck? What did he, where did he hold all his, all his money? Gold. He had it in gold and he had it in a vault, in gold coins. And what did he used to do? He used to go to the vault and swim in it and jump in it and play with it. That's hoarding, right? That's hoarding. But what do are, what are, what are, what are rich people actually do with their money? They invest it. What actually drives economic growth? Investment, right? I mean, they tell us that consumption is 70% of the economy. Every act of consumption requires how many acts of production? At least two, multiple acts of production. You can't consume anything until you have worked, i.e. produced, in order to have the money to consume it, right? That's one act. The second act is in order to consume something, the thing has to be produced. And of course, that thing to be produced had a whole chain, a whole supply chain of production that got it to the store so that you could consume it. So what actually drives an economy is production. It's work. It's creating stuff. It's building stuff. And indeed, that's also the hard part, right? The hard part is to decide where to invest your money, how to invest it, what to produce, what to create, how to build supply chains, how to get the stuff to the store. Consumption is easy. I put any one of you in the mall with some cash, and you're going to spend it. The challenge of economics is not to get people to consume. The challenge in economics is how do you invest, and how do you invest well, and how do you maximize production? That's what it's all about from a purely economic perspective. So there's no... And, and I haven't heard any other economic argument about why inequality is bad, other than poor people consume more. So we should give them more money so they can consume more. Right? Which is, by the way, what we did during COVID. And we saw what happened. You get, you know, when you hand people money you've just printed and tell them to go consume it, what you get is higher prices. So what's the real argument about inequality. It's not economics. They couch it in economics. They come up with formulas to pretend. They always say some economists believe that there's economic problems, but nobody's ever come up with an actual economic theory that explains why inequality is a problem, is a challenge, because it isn't. Indeed, there are lots of reasons why from a purely economic perspective, allowing, in a sense, allowing, right, just a language, right, uh, allowing people to get rich is an incentive, it's, it, 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 it spurs entrepreneurship, it spurs hard work, it's, you know, there are lots of incentive arguments why you want inequality in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an economy in order to spur production. I mean, the real argument about inequality has nothing to do with economics. It has everything to do with philosophy. Both your moral perspectives and your perspective about the very nature, I think, of human beings. So one of the analogies everybody always uses with regard to inequality is this idea of, you know, some people have more, some people have less of the national pie. There's a pie, right? There's, a, there's a, the, the national wealth. It's, it's one big, it's like a pizza, right? There's a big pizza over here. And some people got more slices of the pizza and some people have less slices of the pizza. And that's not fair. And that resonates with people. The reason people really get attached to this idea of inequality is, wait a minute, I mean, you come, uh, you know, you invite a bunch of friends to your home and you order a pizza, and then you take half of it, and you, you know, the rest of them get the crumbs. And people go, wait, wait a minute, you know, aren't we supposed to share this equally? We're all sitting around, or in the family, right? You, the, the kids are always comparing who got the biggest slice, right? Shouldn't we get the same slice? And they take that thought about a pizza, a pie, and they apply it to the economy, right? If the billionaires got a lot of 
stuff, then I must have gotten less. Now, what, what's the fallacy there? I mean, there are many fallacies, but what's one of the fallacies there about this pie? Well, it's clearly a zero-sum game. And one of the things I don't think we realize, most of us, those of us are interested in free market economics, is how prevalent the zero-sum mentality is in the world out there. People think, or don't think, <laughs> anti-thought, in terms of zero-sums. They don't understand, and almost nobody teaches it, nobody explains to them that it's not zero-sum. That trade is a value added. Trade is a fundamentally win-win relationship, win-win transaction. Otherwise, you don't engage in the trade. Now, it's not always. Sometimes you buy a bad product. Sometimes you make a mistake. But it's always the intention that both sides are better off. Each side is trying to maximize their own utility or their own well-being, their own flourishing. So people have a mentality of zero sum. And yet, clearly, the world is not zero sum. Clearly, the world is massively additive. And, but we don't have, economists in particular, don't have a way to really illustrate this. Because you can't measure the value created through trade. Not really. I mean, I, I, I like to use my iPhone in talks, right? So I bought this iPhone. It cost me $1,000. Right? $1,000 for an iPhone. Um, how much is the iPhone worth to me? More than $1,000. I mean, you guys all know this, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered spending the $1,000 to get it. How much more? Yeah, I mean, you don't know. I, I, I mean, maybe I know, but you don't know. And those of you economists don't know how to measure how much more. You know, some economists call it consumer surplus, whatever the hell that means. Can't measure it. But this is worth tens of thousands of dollars to me. I mean, really, I can't really put a number because it's so valuable to me. I can call my kids up anywhere in the world, read them a bedtime story by video at a marginal cost of zero. Zero. How much is that worth to me? Can I monetize that? Much more than $1,000. I can listen to every piece of music ever written in all of human history, right, that was produced and recorded at a marginal cost of zero. I can make long distance phone calls. I mean, you guys think long distance phone calls have always been at a marginal cost of zero, but no, they won't. They used to be super expensive. When I moved to the US, the side story, when I moved to the US, I never, I, I moved from Israel, I never called my parents. Like once every three months, I would call them. And partially it was because I couldn't afford it and they couldn't afford it. So you never made the call, right? Today, I can call them every day, all the time, marginal cost of zero. And, and you could go on and on. I mean, the way I found this university, with, without a map. You remember those? Driving with a map. How many accidents have, has, has this thing prevented, the GPS system on these things prevented? Because we don't have to drive and look at a map at the same time. Or have our wives look at a map even, uh, even worse. Um, the source of many, many fights, right? Between husband and wife is whether who's right on the map. Uh, that's all gone because we know the iPhone is always right. Uh, and then, not to mention your ability to access every piece of information, every piece of knowledge, books, articles, news, everything right here at your fingertips. If you had to recreate this 15 years ago, it would have cost you millions of dollars. And you can get it at $1,000 today. What a deal. But how much value is that created for me? You don't know. All you can, all you can measure is 1000 bucks. So I feel like, you know, if all of the economist is measuring is 1000 bucks, I'm even. I'm break even. What about Apple? Apple made 500 bucks. We all know that. Profit margin on these things is about 50%, or at least used to be. And they made 500 bucks. So it looks like they made 500 bucks, and at best, I'm equal. I'm at even. So they're making money. I'm not better off. My bank account, actually, actually, if you look at my bank account, which is what Piketty does, right? Inequality just increased. Every time I buy an iPhone, inequality goes up. I get poorer by $1,000, and Apple gets richer by $500. Every time you buy anything, 
Anytime you buy anything, anytime you consume cash, because economists can only actually measure the dollars, you get poorer, and whoever you paid the money to gets richer. And surprise, surprise, they become billionaires and we stay where we are. But we're not staying where we are. Why? Because we have this cool stuff, which again, we can't measure, but our lives are better off. So there's a certain appeal to the zero sum mentality particularly if you're not going to be very conceptual, if you're not going to rise to the challenge, if you're not going to make an effort, if you're not going to really think about it. Most people today take their iPhones and their smartphones for granted. They just accept them. They're just there. They've always been there. They always will be there. There's no conception of the value they add to their lives and, the, and, and what the transactional value really is and who's benefiting the most. Clearly, I benefit from the iPhone a lot more than the 500 bucks that Apple profited from it. My gain is far exceeds Apple's gain. I become much richer than Steve Jobs did because of what I purchased. So one of the problems with the pie is that it has a zero sum mentality. And it has a static mentality. The pie is fixed. When actual trade and production, the pie is constantly growing. But that's not the real problem with the pie. What's, what's the bigger problem with the pie? There is no pie. Well, there is no pie. Oh, what is there? There is no big pie. Now, what is there? Many small ones. Many small ones. There's your pie and your pie and your pie and your pie. And then what we've done is mush them all together and pretend there's one big pie, a collective pie. Yes, there's a whole variety of pies. But we're talking just money now. We're just talking about in monetary terms. So they're all dollars or euros or whatever you use in the Czech Republic, right, for now. I hear you're changing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's this, you know, we've all, I mean, they're all different because the, the, the consumer uh, surplus that I get from the iPhone is also a pie. But let's just stick to the dollars because it's easy, right? May I just, one quick Sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to we'll get to oh, that. Happy. Yes, we'll get no, to inequality. Yeah, we'll get to that sense of inequality. No, I, I promise we'll get to that sense of inequality. Uh, so there is no pie. Each one of us bakes our own pie, and then some economist squishes them all together and pretends there's something called GDP. But there's no such thing as gross domestic product. There's no such thing as national income. There's no such thing as a national wealth. There's each one of our wealths, and somebody is adding them up. It's just a spreadsheet. But you create the wealth that you create. So one of the problems with this pie is that it doesn't exist. And what does exist is yours. And by creating this pie, we're ignoring private property. We're ignoring your right to what you have created. We're ignoring your right to what you own, to your slice of the pie. Nobody has a right to take my pie away from it and mush it with other people's pie and then redistribute it, which is what they are trying to do. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole point about inequality is to take from some and give to others. The whole point of the whole debate is to redistribute wealth. But if you created the wealth, by what right do they take it from you? But this is where they get a little deeper philosophically. Obama, President Obama, gave a famous speech. I can't remember the exact year, 2014 or something like that. I think, I think it was his best speech, his most uh, philosophical speech, and his most evil speech, right? And it's a speech known as, you didn't build that speech. Oh, yeah. And he basically said, which is a deeply philosophical point, which a lot of people believe in, that you're not responsible for baking your own pie. That you whatever you means, right, is not what baked the pie. You couldn't have baked the pie without, uh, you know, without a great school teacher who taught you how to bake. You couldn't have baked the pie without employees who helped you create the wealth and build the company. You couldn't have baked the pie without a government that built the infrastructure and created everything around you to facilitate you building the pie. Indeed, it's not even clear that you baked the pie. 
Because it's not even clear that you as an individual have any free will or have any, uh, any agency over baking the pie. It's just your DNA did it. You're programmed to bake pies. You know, and if you're programmed to bake pies, and if there's no free will, there's no agency, then if somebody takes the pie away because you happen to bake a big pie and they want to redistribute it to somebody else, how do you argue against that? The whole idea of property rights, the whole idea of I own it is that I mean something. I means agency. I means I chose. I made an effort. I created. I built. What Obama's trying to do is undermine the whole idea of deserve, of desert, of, ha of, of really deserving something. Because you did it. You created it. You built it. You didn't build it. Other people did it. You owe them. As it turns out, I pay my employees. As it turns out, government can't build its infrastructure, not a single piece of infrastructure until it takes my money. Indeed, businessmen have to create wealth first, and only then can infrastructure be built. It's not the other way around. It's not first there's infrastructure and then there's business. There's first business and then there's infrastructure. And you can look at history and you can see that. There's, somebody has to create wealth that needs to be stolen in order to be, produce the kind of infrastructure that we have. If you really think that you had a great teacher who really helped you and made it possible for you to be successful in life, go find her, say thank you. If you want, write her a check. That would be nice. But she taught a lot of students and some of them succeeded and some of them failed. It's still up to you and what you did with what she taught you that made it possible for you to succeed. So one of the things we have to do if we're going to fight this whole inequality thing is defend human agency, defend the idea of free will, defend the idea that you did build that, that it is your effort, your energy, your thinking, your reason, your work that creates the wealth that you own. And it, you own it because you did it. So... To, you know, they have this perception of zero sum. They have a perception of man as, a, as a, a being with no free will, just an automaton. They have the perception that there's no such thing as private property as a consequence. And therefore, they can take it and mush it all together. I actually did an interview one, once. This guy used to do these interviews in a car, right? He used to tape you in a car. And we drove up and we bought a bunch of pies. And we mushed them all together to illustrate the point. And it, you know, when you mush pies together, but you, all you do is create a mess. It's not a good idea. But they undermine. The whole issue of inequality is an attempt to undermine every aspect of wealth creation, every aspect of economic activity, undermine the very essence of what it takes to create wealth, which is entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial effort and using the human mind to, to change the world around us. And they're trying to undermine that and defeat that and demolish it. And of course, all in the cause of trying to get rid of private property and be able to redistribute wealth at will, which is at the end of the day what Piketty wants. Right? Now, there is, of course, the question of, well, if you care about inequality, why limit it to wealth? Why should it be only wealth inequality? What about other ways in which we're unequal? And, you know, intellectuals, uh, particularly on the left, have struggled with this because their ideal is true egalitarianism. And the fact is that we're not the same. If you look at any group of people, they're always all different in multiple dimensions. There's a, there's a true story that I think illustrates the problem that the people who advocate for equality face and, and how they solve it. Right? So there was a group of intellectuals who actually went to, went to study in Paris, to Sorbonne, to study with the, with the great, you know, great uh, thinkers of the time, Sartre and the other, the egalitarians, the people who, who were advocating at the time complete equality. And equality of outcome in the economic sphere, but really equality of, of... And these guys took the classes, took it very seriously, and decided when they were going to get... They were going to go back home where they lived, 
and, and they were going to, they were going to impose this. They were going to make this real. This utopia was not just going to be in the, in the books. This utopia was going to become a reality in the world out there. And they did. They went back home. They gained political power. And they started to implement this. So the first thing they observed, first thing they observed was some people lived in, city, in a city. There was one city. And some people lived in a countryside. And this is a problem because they clearly advantages to living in the city. And, uh, and, you know, the people in the countryside don't have. And so how do you equate? How, how do you get people to be equal when some people live in the city and some people live in the countryside? What do you do? Yeah, you force them out of the city. So they forced them out of the city, literally. It came a day, everybody had to evacuate the city. They marched them out of the city into the countryside. We'll get there, right? I'm building up, right? You're stealing my thunder. I know, I know, I know. Some people know, some people don't. I have to, you know, I have to, you know, to, to, to be able to perform, I have to at least believe some people don't know. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay. We are a terrible audience. What's that? We are a terrible audience. Anyway, right, even in the countryside, they're not equal, right? Because some people are better at foraging for food, and some people are worse off at foraging for food. Some people are better at agriculture. Some people are worse. Some people can read. Some people cannot. Some people are intelligent. Some people are not. What do you do? Well, what you do is you kill off the people who are more in any dimension. So if you wore glasses, you were shot. If you had a college degree or high school degree, you were shot. If you were good at foraging, you were shot. If you were good at anything, you were shot. They literally killed 40% of their own people. Two million out of five million, they killed them. That is indeed the killing fields of Cambodia. You can go there, you can see, see what happened. And to, 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 the day, to the day that he died, Pol Pot, who was the commander of this, thought he did nothing wrong. Because he was just trying to achieve an ideal. The ideal of equality that is being taught everywhere. And people who have a false ideal like this, an ideal that clearly goes against nature, because even if you kill 40% of the population, the remaining people are still unequal. Because there's literally no way to make us equal. We're all different. Just look around the room. Look around any room, anywhere. It's what makes life interesting and fun, the fact that we are different. And it makes specialization possible. It makes everything that we take for granted again possible is the fact that we are different. And they want to wipe that out. So when I think inequality, I think Pol Pot. That's what they really want. They might be disguising it in pleasant, nice terminology. But when I think, when I think uh, Thomas Piketty, I think Pol Pot. Just another Frenchman educating you know, uh, homicidal maniacs to go out and, and, and do his bidding. Because that's what it has to lead to. Because there's no way to equate us. There's no way to make us equal. If I put any group of people on a desert island and come back a year later, they're not going to be the same. Some of them are going to be good fishermen and they're going to go out and fish a lot. Other people are going to be good at guy. Some people are going to be lazy and sit a lot at the beach and go swimming often and, and just do enough to get a piece of fish and a piece of vegetable here and there. You're going to have all kinds of people. Some people will write stories or, tell, or be the storytellers of the island. Yeah, you, some people will sing and some people, God forbid, you know, don't sing, right? That's part of what it means to be human. We have, we're different, and we're different because we make different choices. We're different because we have different wiring to some extent. We're different because we have different interests, different values, different perspectives. So the whole inequality debate, I think, is ultimately geared towards undermining what makes us human, our reason, our choices, Siri always interrupts me. Um, <laughs> its goal is this ideal of metaphysical equality, which is impossible. 
and evil because it denies it denies what it means to be human it denies a capacity to be individuals capacity to think for ourselves it denies the, indeed the sanctity of individual life it's a rejection of all that it is pu it is the worst form of collectivism because it ultimately breeds nihilism and breeds destruction for the sake of destruction it, you know 40 percent of the population and 50 percent of the population there's no end you wipe up everybody because they didn't live up to your standards so you just kill them all which is ultimately the, the logical consequence of what happened in a place like cambodia i mean think about it the cambodians were stopped from killing 40 after killing 40 percent of their own population by vietnamese communists who thought the, the cambodians were horrible right in communism, how many, how many millions has communism killed? But even for them, this kind of egalitarianism was too much. But this is what they're really preaching. Now, one other thing that they leverage, and one other thing that makes it sound appealing, is that equality sounds like a good idea in a context. Indeed, in the Declaration of Independence, what I think is the greatest political document ever written, it says all men are created equal. What did they mean? I mean, the founding fathers were no idiots, and they, they, they certainly weren't egalitarians, and they could see that people were not equal. So what did they mean by all men are created equal? In what sense are we equal? Before the law, or deeper even than before the law, we're all equal in our freedom, in our rights. We're all equal, equally free. We all have, all of us have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, property and the pursuit of happiness. Fundamentally, we all have the right to life. That's what it means to be equal. Not equal in outcome, not equal as the conservatives say of opportunity, because there is no such thing as opportunities. Opportunities are just middle of the road outcomes, right? What does it mean to have equal opportunities? It doesn't really mean everybody gets the same schooling. How does that happen? Different people have different teachers, different parents send their kids to different schools. Nothing's going to be equal about that. There's no such thing as equality of opportunity any more than there is of equality of outcome. We're different. Some parents work really, really hard so their kids have more opportunities. Some parents don't. And they can set few opportunities. That's just life. That's just reality. What the founders meant is political equality. We're all equally free. We're all equal before the law. We're all equal in our rights. Those rights should be protected equally. So equality before the law. So equality, political equality, is a valid concept. It's an important concept. And what the egalitarians leverage is this idea, particularly in America, that we have, oh, equality, political equality, equality is a good thing, and then they poison it with this content that makes equality mean something that certainly the founders didn't mean it to have, um, but that I don't think anybody, anybody really who thinks it through would want it to have, unless they're nihilistic and destructive. And indeed, the only way to create any semblance of equality of outcome is to violate the principle of equality of rights. The only way to make us equal, for example, in income or wealth is to take wealth from some and give it to others, violating the principle of equality before the law. Why are some people tax at 50%, some people tax at 10%? Is that equality before the law? Clearly not equal. Some people are taxed at a higher rate than other people. So the whole idea of equality is violated once you start redistributing wealth, once you start having taxation, once you negate the idea that what people create is theirs, once you negate the idea of private property, once you negate the idea of rights, the right to your own life, which property is part of. So any act of equality, of, of dealing with, quote, inequality, entails violating political rights. And of course, the Khmer Rouge example in Cambodia is a perfect example 
of them. In order to make a sequel, you gotta kill us. You gotta take our ultimate right, our right to life, and every aspect of it. So we need to defend is political equality. We need to fully understand what it means, equality of rights, equality of freedom, equality of liberty. And if we can defend that, then this idea of economic inequality, this idea that egalitarians spread, this idea that is so popular and so prevalent everywhere. You know, the obvious, uh, the, the contradictions become obvious. It's not enough just to argue against the, the idea that inequality is important, but you have to argue for something. And the only alternative, the thing to argue for that I think undermines inequality completely is to argue for liberty, for freedom, for freedom of the individual to pursue his life based on his own ideas, his own values, based on his reason, his rational, rational mind. And when the government protects his individual rights and leaves him alone, protects his ability to live his life based on his own judgment and otherwise leaves him alone. And how much inequality will result from that? I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. Indeed, the more rich people there are, the more likely it is that all of our lives are better off. Because we traded with them, we got iPhones, they got my money. I'll take the iPhone any day over my money. Because I get a lot more value from that than a thousand dollars sitting in my bank account. That's why I did the trade. So I'll do it over again, over and over and over again. So we should reject all arguments around inequality and we should uphold the principle of freedom and liberty. Thank you. for the talk. Uh, I think we have enough time for questions. Uh, just a quick note before we start the questions. Uh, if you start leaving while we are still answering, don't forget to grab the books on, the, on, on your way. And if I can ask you, don't forget to sign the attendance sheet so that we know how many people exactly we had here. We will really appreciate it. And don't and forget to make a contribution because it's value for value, win-win. You're winning by getting a book. Make them win too. Exactly, and sign up for the conference in Athens, and sign up for the SFL conference in Lisbon that's coming on the 24th, 22nd uh, and 23rd, uh, Liberty Con Europe. I think uh, the Energy Institute is also going to be presented there. And uh, that's all from me, and now let's move forward with the questions. I think I've already seen one over there, yes. I'm Paul Kuduja, from the University of Economics. I would like to ask you, what do you think about the unconditional basic income and the uh, arguments behind it. <laughs> so the question is about the unconditional basic income. Um, I mean, I, I think broadly it is an awful idea. Um, I think it's I think it's horrible. It's again the idea legitimizes that some people they need the fact that they have less gives them some kind of moral political claim against those people who have and who produced and who created who have the money. And somehow that that need must be satisfied. And now we're just debating about what the most efficient way to satisfy their need. But I reject the moral claim that your need is a claim against me. Your need is your need. Deal with it. Now you want me to help you ask. I might voluntarily help you, I might not. But you have no right to my wealth, you have no right to my money just because you're needy. So the government has no business in redistributing wealth. If people individually want to redistribute wealth for a variety of reasons in the sense of helping somebody, then they can help somebody. So I think UBI is a horrible idea because it institutionalizes this mentality and it makes it more efficient. Granted, it's more efficient than the welfare state. But that's exactly why we should oppose it. Right? You know, an efficient criminal is a lot worse than an inefficient criminal. Because an efficient criminal you know, it, we, we've legitimized it, we've legalized it, we've made it okay, and we've, we've, we've granted it authority. Now, saying all that, as a mechanism to get rid of the welfare state, right, particularly in America, which has an absurd welfare state, I mean, Europeans you know, know how to do a welfare state properly, the Americans are complete, it's, it's a complete disaster. Right? As a way to get rid of the welfare state temporarily, yes, but then you have to only 
say, we're going to have this temporarily. We're going to phase it out. Here's the plan. Over 20 years, the UBI will go down a little bit every year. And it's going to zero, guys. It really is going to zero because you don't have a right to this. We're just doing this to, to, to get you over the hump because it's been, welfare has been promised. And we don't want to completely renege on the promises. So we're going to transition it out. But you have to be very explicit, otherwise you don't have a moral argument to make. And then it makes sense, because in the United States, for example, the US probably has, I don't know, I'm making the number up right now, 150 different welfare programs. And that's probably just at the federal level, and then you have a state level, and local level. It's just that, and, does that, and to unwind all that is, you don't even know where to start, and who's gonna get hurt, and where it, it you know, Aggregate them all, get rid of every single one of them, replace it with the UBI, and then the UBI gets cut every single year by a certain amount. And that is one way to get rid of the welfare state in, in a place like the United States. Um, but that would be the only reason to do it, and I would never be an advocate for it. Because again, if, if you advocate for redistribution, you're advocating for theft, you're advocating for taking from some their property and giving to others. Um, and you're advocating for the moral, the moral idea, which is need generates a claim against somebody who's been used, which I think is is really evil. Yeah. And to play devil's advocate, how about the claim that we need to uh, worry about inequality to keep the peasants from from revolting? Yeah, I hear that claim usually from rich people. So a lot of rich people say, look. I don't mind this because I have to worry about inequality. This is this is an important issue because I think uh, they'll, if if we don't throw them, if we don't bribe them, then there's going to be a revolution. And the reality is that there's never been a revolution in a free economy uh, with high inequality. The, you know the, the revolution. I always say, I say, well, what revolution? Give me an example. The French Revolution. Well, yeah, but those were kings. They they stole the money from the peasants. And the peasants revolted. Good for the peasants. I mean, not good for what they did after they saw, they, they revolted, but they, right? But take Hong Kong, which had huge inequality. There was no revolution in Hong Kong. I mean, there was a revolution against the Chinese authorities. There was a revolution for more say in the politics of Hong Kong. But there was no revolution in terms of going after and killing the rich people because they, they stole all the money. Because poor people benefit enormously from the fact that these people create jobs and they know it. Uh, there was no revolution in the 19th century America, which is claimed to be one of the highest periods of inequality ever. Now, there is, if you, on the other hand, if you do teach the workers, the masses, however you want to call it, if you teach them that they're being uh, exploited, if you teach them that it's a zero-sum world and uh, you know the rich are benefiting from their labor and they're being, you know, they're being, it's taken over, then they will become politically active. And they will put together a political program that expropriates the wealth of the rich and gives it to the poor, which is what we got in most democracies around the world. Uh, but that goes to the point where, you know, if you teach bad ideas, you can have bad outcomes. Education, 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 it's all about education. If we teach people rotten ideas, there's no way we're going to get good outcomes from them. Yeah. You? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, do I understand you? Uh, I understand that you are against any form of redistribution. Yes. What is your point against the redistribution which would imply, I think the term is negative income tax, or the American term is income tax credit, so that you have a very moderate form of redistribution which makes people work as a precondition for, for welfare benefits. So it seems to be a, a good way to eliminate um, Poverty without the, and in a relatively inexpensive way to, to eliminate suffering and poverty without the uh, pervert incentives of the of the of the yeah. welfare programs. What's well, your, what so first you of all, this is point this, this is a, a an idea presented by Milton Friedman, and what actually was picked up in the United States with the earned income credit, yeah. and was implemented. And one of the problems in the United States was, I'll get to the why I'm against it in a minute. But one of the problems in the United States was. It wasn't implemented to replace welfare. It was implemented in addition to 150 other welfare sure. things. And that was a big mistake Milton Friedman made, I think, because uh, it's, it's a disaster. Because you can gain, I mean, the way they gain the system and all of that, it's just, it's just really stupid policy. Um, but look, I'm, I'm against any government intervention in the distribution of income. I don't think it's a government's job. 
The government is there to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to protect us, protect our rights, protect our liberties, protect us from thieves, crooks, criminals, terrorists, fraudsters, people like that. Um, if I want to give, I can create a charity, I can give to a charity, you know, there are lots of ways in which we can, we can apply, um, uh, you know, helping the poor who, who can't succeed. I, you know, and I, and I don't typically, my main argument against um, redistribution is not primarily economic, because you're right, I mean, uh, negative income tax has little economic impact. It has some, because you're taking money from some people to give to others, you can't not do that. Uh, but it has the least amount. And again, I think it's better than UBI. Um, I, I think it would be a better way to do it. But again, I would be in favor of only it was phased out to zero after X number of years, because I still think it's morally wrong to use coercion, to use force, to take from some people and give to others, as poor as they may be. They can ask for help, and that's what charity does. Charity gives through voluntary interaction, help to those who need it, but it avoids the course of power of government. Government is coercion. That's the essence of government. And I think the only reason to use coercion, the only reason to use a gun, or physical force is in self-defense. And there's no self-defense. This is clearly violating the rights of those people who have to pay into the system so that those people will get their negative income tax. So it's the most efficient way of doing warfare, but still morally, I think, offensive. Yeah. Uh, since the biggest source of uh, uh, government-induced violence-based uh, inequality is the cantillon effect through the centralized money printing, but uh, those who get the money first spend it on the old prices. Uh, do you think that, uh, are you against the centrally uh, organized money printing? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I'm against central banks. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's a way of controlling the population, it's a way of controlling the economy, it's a way of controlling our choices. Um, I don't think it's efficient, I think economically it's a disaster. Central planning doesn't work on the production of bread, it certainly doesn't work on the production of interest rates and uh, the production of money. Uh, I think, I think, you know, people say, the Federal Reserve screwed up and we have inflation now. That's a completely wrong statement. The Federal Reserve always screws up. It has manifested itself today in consumer prices going up. But the rest of the time, it's manifested itself in malinvestment, in misallocation of capital, in a million other things that are going on because the central plan is allocating capital instead of allowing the market to do so. And it's allocating capital based because it sets interest rates and because it is printing money. So it, from an, as an economist, I would say it's, it's bad for the economy to have a central bank. And, and economists who've looked at this and compared at least in the US, pre-central bank, post-central bank. And pre-central bank America had a terrible system. It's not like that was a good system. And it was still more stable than the post-central bank. But if you compare central banks um, in, in countries that actually had good systems before, it's night and day. Clearly, markets do a much better job. We know this from every product. Every product we, we have, that markets do a much better do job in terms of allocating uh, in terms of producing a, a, an efficient product. Uh, money and interest rates are the most important product in the economy because everybody uses them. Every act of production requires money and it requires and usually it involves interest rate. Every act of valuation, if you're in finance, every act of valuation requires discounting future cash flows, which means using an interest rate. Interest rate is the most important parameter in the marketplace and yet that's the one we leave to 12 guys in a room, you know, smoke-filled room to, to, to make a decision on based on, you know, the Federal Reserve has, uh, empl is the largest employer of economists in the world. Uh, based on a bunch of economists sitting around and centrally planning. But central planning doesn't work. It never has. So I think the business cycle is a consequence of central planning. Um, I, I think malinvestment and misallocation of capitalism is responsible. I think the central banks caused the great financial crisis. I mean, the, the central banking is a disaster, and it's not surprising because it's a government monopoly, and it's, it's, it's you know, uh, we learned from the Soviet Union not to let central planners um, 
get involved in food production because then you get long lines of bread, right? Or you get excess, right? You either get excess or shortages because you can't get the price right. Hayek wrote a lot about this. You don't get the price right. right? But he wrote it, you know, his perspective was wrong. The reason, the fundamental reason that you can't get the price right is because they don't know what my values are. They can't. It's not an issue of the, the, the amount of computing power. It's, you can't know how much I'm willing to pay for the bread, what, my, what the value of that bread is to me. So if we don't let them do bread, why are we letting them do money? Which is a thousand times more important. So it's Bitcoin social? The problem with Bitcoin is, is not that it's social, it's not... The problem with Bitcoin is... I mean, there are two problems, I think. I think in a free market, in a true free market, I think it would lose. I just don't think it would be the winner in terms of currency because I don't think people would be willing to just accept money that was just in the cloud, in a sense, just bits. I think they would want something tangible. So I think gold would not compete it. I just, I mean, I'm fine with playing that out, right? I, I would love to live in a world where Bitcoin and gold competed over which one is going to be money. But I think the bigger problem with Bitcoin is that central banks won't allow it. I mean, we can pretend all we want, but at the end of the day, uh, governments have big, powerful tools that clamp down and destroy whatever you create. And, uh, and the real danger, the real danger is that they don't allow it. So I'm, I'm all for running an experiment. I love the idea of freedom and experimenting, figuring out what works and what doesn't. But it's not going to happen because we don't live in a free society. There's no shortcuts, in other words, to liberty. You either do the hard work of educating people and ultimately getting involved in politics and changing the political world, or nothing will happen. Technology won't give us a, an end route into liberty somehow through a back alley. It just, it just can't. It, it doesn't work that way. We still live in the physical world. We don't live in, uh, in the metaverse. Russia just experienced their results being seized by the uh, U.S. Uh, so I think that, uh, that even the governments now see that they need something uh, that is not uh, in the hands of one government. So maybe they will see that since they compete against each other, they will need some neutral money at the end. Gold. Yeah, you are, you are, you are very... Um, okay, so, so you're going to you're maintain that we're moving towards freedom because Russia and China are going to gang up and create a currency that is going to liberate all of us. If they if they create an alternative currency, it'd be one that uh, that you know that enslaves us even more, not that frees us more. And and a digital currency, a digital currency run by the Chinese and the Russians will be one that monitors every single purchase that you make. I mean, the Chinese central bank already has a digital currency. It's been experimenting with digital currencies for three, four years. And why is it doing it? Because that way they can really get a social score on you. Not only will they have a camera everywhere monitoring you, not only do they have an app on your device that tells them where you are, but now they know every single monetary transaction that you're engaged in. That's why they want to do it. At least with dollars, you're not being tracked every single day, and you can still use cash, which is the ultimate anonymizer, right? You can ultimately, uh, you can buy stuff without them tracking you. To rely on Russia, To supply us with a tool for liberty is worse than science fiction. Right, right. The competition won't arise. And, and by the way, it, 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 it's, just not, it's, it's just not going to happen. The dollar, whether we like it or not, and I don't, but the dollar is here to stay as a global currency. It's, that's not going to change. Because the United States is too powerful, and it's too easy to, to use and move dollars around the world. And it, 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 people around the world would much rather have dollars than you are. Because it's run by authoritarian state, and and the other BRICs are all authoritarian countries that nobody wants to do business with, not really. So I, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I hope there is a path. Yeah. Uh, to this point, you still need to exchange the dollar for the yuan somehow, and that intermediary, that could be the free currency or something. But if, but if the government decides that you can't use that as a currency, so if, if the government tomorrow decides you cannot use Bitcoin in the United States to buy anything. Assuming Bitcoin is an intermediate, intermediate currency, that means there's no more trouble. Whatever the intermediate currency is, if the United States government says you can't buy Teslas with this currency, 
then you can't buy stuff with that currency, and it's not a currency anymore. What's, a, what's, what's the definition of a currency? What's Mises' definition of money? Those uh, the three points or whatever they were? It's, it's, the, it's the common medium of exchange. If, if, if what you're using is not a medium of exchange, because nobody will exchange anything because it's illegal to exchange with you, then it stops being money. June, that would also mean that no more trade to China, so... Um, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, you need the intermediate currency to buy stuff from China. If you can't use it anymore, no trade with China. Yeah, so you don't have trade with China. I think a lot of people would like not to have trade with China at this point. But right now, you can exchange yuan for dollars without an intermediate currency. You can change them directly. But you cannot buy Teslas with gold either. No, and gold is not money. I, I'm not claiming gold is money today. Gold is not money. Money, you know what money is? No, no. I, I thought I had dollar bills in my pocket. Dollar bills money. I can go anywhere in the world, I can exchange them, I can use them to buy. It's not good money, but it's money. And it's, the, it's a medium exchange, everybody uses them. And the reality is that in order to compete with the dollar, you have to create a currency that is going to provide you with more convenience, not less, in the purchase of goods and services. And if you can add anonymity and all of that, great. But the reality is 99% of people out there don't care about anonymity. They give their name and credit card information to any schmuck who asks them, right? And uh, so, yes, so there'll be, a, there'll be a million libertarians around the world trading with one another in, in, um, in goods over the internet. They can't be physical goods because the government will ban the transaction into physical goods. It, you know, and, and, and you'll have a currency between each other, but that's not a, it's not going to challenge the dollar. Gold's at least readily convertible. <clears throat> what? Gold's at least readily convertible to dollars. Yeah, so it's Bitcoin right now, but that could, that could change very quickly. And, and it could change, you know, people forget, in 1933, in 1933, I think it was March, uh, FDR, the President of the United States, confiscated all the gold in the United States. He basically took it from every single American, and there was no revolution, by the way, which is shocking. And he took all the gold, it was illegal to own gold in the United States until 1972, one or two, um, when, when Richard Nixon took us, it took, uh, it did away with Bretton Woods and legalized the ownership of gold in the United States. So for 40 years, I mean, it's incomprehensible to us today. It was illegal to own gold in the U.S. So governments can be brutal and they can do unbelievable things and they can get away with it. Which is, I mean, they locked us up during COVID, right? So they can get away with a lot and we don't seem to resist it. So. Uh, yes, even gold is not necessarily convertible into dollars um, in, uh, in a world where it's illegal to own gold. All I'm saying is, I'd love to see the competition go out there and, and, and test it out, but for that we need freedom. Freedom has to come first. You're not going to get freedom through the back door of, of, of Bitcoin or technology. You need freedom first, and then let's rip in terms of digital currencies that compete with one another and gold and everything else. Um, Ultimately, all money will be digital. There's no question. The question is, will it be backed by something physical or not? I believe it'll be backed by something physical. Some of you don't. I have no problem with that disagreement. Let's play it out in the marketplace. That's, that's, that's where it should be played out. That's the beauty of markets. We have competing ideas and we test them out. Yeah. Drugs are banned and you still can buy them uh, around the corner. So I don't think it's such a big problem. Yeah, but you can also spend a lot of time in jail. Yes, yeah, but, 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 but you still buy it just to you just go all the time and buy it. I'm with you. So, and, and it, there's always a black market, always a black market in anything that's prohibited. So you can buy gold, but, it, but, but the difference is that drugs, you can smoke or you can inject. You can actually do something with it that gives you something, right? Whether good or not, it gives you something. Um, black markets and all kinds of goods, and cigarettes and all kinds of goods, there's a value to it. Uh, having a black market in Bitcoin takes you nowhere. It's a dead end because you can't do it anymore. It's the same. Yeah, I buy uh, weed, I sell weed for more, and then I buy my Tesla. And the same is with Bitcoin. I buy Bitcoin, I sell my Bitcoin for more, and then I yeah, buy. But you Tesla. see, this is uh, you know, this is this is, this is this is exactly the problem with crypto, right? Crypto, you know, I'm all pro crypto, but the point is, you have to have a use. If there's no use, of the use you just explained is I'm flipping it, I'm speculating, and I'm using it to buy other crypto. Crypto is good to buy other crypto. That's not a use. That's just trading for the sake of trading. 
And that's ridiculous. That that is not that's not a use case. Yeah, I'm right? saving. I'm not. Uh... You're not saving. There's no value there. And as soon as everybody realizes there's no value there, it goes to zero. As it went from sixty to twenty, now it's twenty-five. So who knows? But the trading in itself doesn't create value. Everything. The end use case for Bitcoin is not that I can sell it to somebody else. The end use case for Bitcoin is that I can buy the Tesla with the Bitcoin, and that it preserves supposedly it preserves its value. It hasn't. But it preserves its value, and I don't use it for currency one day. But that that is what I'm saying. Governments won't allow. Yeah, they won't allow they, competition to the. So what's the argument against uh, uh, banning? Before we before we continue, I'm against banning. I'm not for banning anything. Before we continue with the discussion, do we have any Bitcoin unrelated questions so that we yeah. also? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I understood uh, that you are against any. Um, Intervention by the government in order to redistribute for for poverty yep. um, reduction. Do, are you, um, do you accept there's a governmental role for police, for example? Or yeah, would you, would, or would, is this something? No, I believe I, I'm not okay, an anarchist. Okay, so, okay, this doesn't help, but this is my question. Yeah. Um, you say you are morally against any form of. Redistribution. You would even yeah. reject poverty alleviation in the form of negative income yes. taxes, which is the most efficient, yes. without most of the of the moral hazard, which which retains the incentive to work. To work. How how come that you can then, given that you are against any form of redistribution, support poli policing? What, what Because with the police, you, you may argue the police. Is you can buy it on your own. You can buy guardians to protect their to property, to chase whatever sure, sure. Uh, uh, burglars on sure. your own. And the governmental police would imply redistribution. Sure. So if you are against redistribution in any case, why? why no, it's a good question. Why is, why is here your position different? It's a good question. And I have, yes. to, I have to practice my answer because no, it's very different. It's a fundamental difference. It's a it's a fundamental deep difference. Uh, and I have to practice my answer because I'm debating. Uh, philosopher Brian Kaplan on this very question uh, later this year, so I better get it. I better be well because he's pretty smart. I don't know if you know Brian Kaplan, but he's a big time yes. libertarian uh, economist philosopher. Um, there's a the government is fundamentally about coercion. It's fundamentally about force. Everything it does is around force. Uh, that's its nature. Its nature is uh, the monopoly over the use of of of, of force of coercion. And then the question is, when is it appropriate to use force? When is it appropriate to use force? And I would argue the only time it's appropriate to use force is in self-defense, is to defend oneself. And therefore, the government's only responsibility is as an agency of self-defense. It's, 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 we have nominated it as an agency to protect ourselves. Now, you say you can have private police forces and private courts. And I say you can't. There is no such thing. It would never survive. It wouldn't survive a week. And the reason is that you have to have some objectivity in how you assign and uh, apply the law. Law is not arbitrary. It's not negotiable. It's not, you know, you have your police force. I have my police force. They have two systems of law. We clash constantly. And what that results in is in violence. So, so private security, private police forces uh, enforcing you know, a variety of different legal systems that are created by the different protection agencies just results in, we have a term for it called anarchy, it just results in violence. It results in clash, a constant clash. So you need, you need a, 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 an entity that establishes a, a, an objective set of rules where we know I have violated your rights and therefore we need to, You know, some some uh, intervention needs to happen here, and there's a system of law that then that then also applies a, a, a particular procedure. So, the entity that is government—that's its job. That's its only job to define objective laws that apply to the sub, to how how we deal with issues of self-defense, how we deal with issues of protecting rights, protecting property, and protecting that. It, it it's not about redistributing wealth. It's about applying those objective laws to a society. Yes. No, he's got to follow up, so I'll let him follow up. Yeah. No, I don't want to monetize. 
Yeah, I have a similar question because anarcho-capitalists would argue that it is a fiction to have this small state because once the government gets power, it tends to expand all the yeah, time. That's about the institutional Look, framework. We can do we can we can do this. Uh, we can do it Bitcoin or we can do anarchy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> both is is a, is a lot. Um, my argument is uh, I can make exactly the same argument for anarchy. Right? I mean, uh, it, it's never survived. It doesn't survive. All it leads to is violence and what the hell. And the reality is that it's that the reason limited governments don't survive as limited governments is because they don't have the ideological and the, and the, the, the philosophical foundation for the limitation. That is, the limitation is not defended philosophically and ideologically, primarily moral. There is no moral argument for why government should be limited other than, in my view, Ayn Rand's argument. Ayn Rand's the only one who provided it. And so, and Ayn Rand came after the Founding Fathers, not before the Founding Fathers. So, it, it, you know, so you got, you got a state that was on very shaky ground when it was founded philosophically, because the founders are on very shaky ground when they found America. And it's done phenomenally well, given how shaky the ground was. But what we need is new ideas to provide a foundation for that limitation. That means we need ideas about what individual rights really mean. Not... I, I, John Locke did a great job, but he didn't go all the way because he couldn't defend, uh, he, I don't think he could defend reason properly. I don't think he could defend uh, the non-initiation of force properly. I, I, he was too influenced by religion. He was too influenced by, by, by altruism, this idea that the need of others is a moral claim against, uh, against people. So there were real flaws in the Enlightenment that resulted in the fact that when limited governments were imposed, the ideology of the culture was opposed to that, and therefore, they couldn't survive. And they still do, again, pretty damn well from an historical perspective. What you need is a philosophy. Now, could any system of government be better than the people that are in, the, the ideas of the people that are in that geographic area? No. I mean, if the people get corrupted, so will the government. That's just the reality. You can't create a system that is perfect if the people don't want it anymore. So, uh, you know, uh, even in the founding of America, I was it, uh, you know, uh, Franklin was walking out of uh, Constitutional Hall and somebody says, what did you guys do? Or, you know, what did you give us? And he says, a republic, if you can keep it, right? And the idea is, if you can keep it, you have to have constant, somebody else said, you know, uh, constant vigilance around liberty. You have to constantly fight for it. It doesn't, you can't establish a system and then we're free and that's it. We can forget about it forever. That will never happen. For instance, Hayek suggested a different institutional, constitutional framework to it. Yeah, but Hayek's institutional, I mean, <laughs> that is so convoluted and so crazy. And again, what Hayek is rejecting, and Jimmy here has written a book about this, so he's the expert, not me. But what Hayek is suggesting is ultimately a rejection of the idea of objective law. What Hayek doesn't recognize, doesn't recognize in his writing, is the idea of individual rights and, a, and an objective conception of individual rights and the idea that once we have a conception of individual rights, like the, the role of government is to protect those rights. So the founding fathers of America got it very close, but they didn't go all the way because they didn't have the philosophical foundations to go all the way. I think we do today. So it's just a matter of education, education, education. There are no shortcuts. Yeah. Um. You are, you are defending your, your idea yes. um, of, a, of, a, of a very limited government in the specific form yeah. that you have. Um, and do you, or do you have a concern or what do you say about the fact that you might, by defending the most uh, relatively radical form of, of, of limited government, um, that you might not make any progress to why, towards the, the idea at all? No, I... I, I, I by, you yeah. have understand? So yeah, I'm I, 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 I want, I want, yeah. The, the I'm fact that from even assuming that, you are, that your version is the, 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 the good one or the right yeah. one, yeah. That, the, that the perfect is the enemy of the, of the good by saying, I do even reject abolishment of all welfare programs in favor of a negative income tax. Yeah. I don't even want to have that at all. You might, yeah, I mean, you might reduce your chance of achieving any progress to zero because your 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 vision will never be accepted and might even hamper any progress towards this government. Well, I want to separate two things. Never is a long time. 
So I would argue that, uh, you know, uh, uh, my vision will manifest itself one day because I think truth ultimately does manifest itself. It's just a matter of time. But I agree with you in the short run. Let's say a bit later. I agree with you in the short run. Um, I think if, if all we want to do right now is shift, to, you know, add a half a percent to GDP, lower taxes a little bit, make the government a little bit more efficient, yeah, my arguments are not going to get us there. I am not fighting for now because I know I'm losing now and I will lose now. I'm not trying to change the politics of today. I'm trying to make a principled case, a principled case for an ideal state one day. And it won't be in my lifetime, and it might not be in my children's lifetime. But the only way we're going to get to a truly limited government, and I believe we won't even get to Milton Friedman type government without this, is by making a principled moral defense of limited government. And once you start making a principled moral defense of limited government, you know, and, it, and you're going to be consistent, then, you know, the logic just leads you in only one direction. And that is that you can't be distributed wealth. Once you distribute wealth, then you're undermining the whole basis of a, uh, a, of a moral government. I would say it's the opposite, right? If you look at America, and, and again, Europe I know less of, but I, I believe this is not true of you, but this is true of America. America used to have a limited government very similar to mine. There was no redistribution of wealth in the 19th century in the United States. Zero. And one of the reasons that we're where we are today, where there's massive redistribution of wealth and it's inefficient and it's ridiculous and it's, it's, it's completely wrong, is because nobody made a moral defense for that system that already existed. It was already there to a large extent. It was flawed in other ways, but it was already there. So I think the only way we're going to see progress Real progress, not the little progress, not that this political party versus that political party, this tax cut, that tax cut. If we're going to see systematic progress towards liberty, the only way to do it is to do it in a principled way, going all the way, making the argument on principled terms. On the way there, we're going to have to make accommodations, right? It's not going to go from zero to one all at once. It'll go in steps. That's why I said, as a step towards ultimate liberty, I think a negative <laughs> tax is not a bad idea. But you have to have a goalpost. You have to know what you're fighting for. And I believe I'm fighting for liberty. And I don't know how to fight for liberty without saying, you taking my money and giving it to somebody else without asking my permission is wrong. Because it is wrong. So, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 and if it's right, if it's right, if it's okay to do, as, because it's efficient, it's a negative income tax, then why not more? Why not take my money and do other things with it? And, and it's not just, I mean, we're focused on redistribution of wealth. I want to do away with the regulatory state. I want to get rid of all government regulations and business. I want to get rid of the Federal Drug Administration. I want drugs to go from drug companies to doctors to patients or direct to patients. I want to legalize all drugs and have private markets deal with the, uh, with the uh, information asymmetries. Private labs. Uh, review drugs. I don't want the government to review drugs. So I want, I want freedom. I want the government to do one thing, which is policing. I want them to do policing and a military and a judiciary. And that's it. Nothing else. A complete separation of state from economics. So I can't, and then I can't start making exceptions because then I, I think slippery slopes do exist. Once you make an exception on principle, there's no end to how many exceptions you're going to have to make. So I'm fighting for that. Now I know that in the meantime, to get there, we're going to have to make all kinds of intermediate steps. I leave that to you. I'm not going to deal with the intermediate steps. I'm going to present the vision out there, which is what ran. Yeah, in the back. Uh, would you say that you're a voluntarist? No, I mean, I don't like that term. I don't know what it exactly means. You don't know what a voluntarist is? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's associated with, with, uh, with anarchism. Um, no, it's not. It's just associated with liberalism and libertarianism in general. And if you're arguing for a state, you should actually be a voluntarist. Because if you're uh, arguing with a anarcho capitalist and you say that you're a voluntarist, you basically destroy their whole case. Because what's going to happen is that- But the laws that are imposed on you, you don't accept voluntarism. No, 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 no. That, that's a social contract, right? That's when you get the social contract. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there is such a thing as a social contract. <laughs> it's, it's a- it, it's How do you establish a state? Not through social contract. Well, how I mean, the founding fathers didn't. It, what was the social contract? They imposed the state on everybody else, right? 
They launched a revolution against the British at a time when many American citizens, maybe not a majority, but many American citizens, didn't want a revolution against the British. And they established a state that most people in America didn't even understand, never mind accept. So there are, you know, there are, there are truths that can be articulated and explained to people and people can get educated about. But what you want is to establish a state that is true, that is right, that is just, which means that it is a protector of individual rights. Yeah, but you gotta give up. I don't need a new word. I, I've got a perfect word for it. It's called capitalism. I don't need another word for it. And anarcho-capitalism, by the way, is a contradiction in terms. You can't have capitalism without, with, if you have anarchy. Okay. Capitalism requires government because it requires the protection of property rights and only a government can do that. Anarchy cannot provide protection of any rights because anarchy by definition rejects the concept of rights because it's all negotiable. Yeah, as, long, as long as the state is uh, funded with a donation of dollar Patreon or something. We can talk about how our state is funded later. But yeah, coercion should be up. Yeah. You said that you don't want to make any exceptions because of this very slow. Yeah. But wouldn't you say, wouldn't you say that uh, no. The <laughs> <laughs> debated anarchists enough to know what they, what's coming. <laughs> no, the state is not a compromise. The state is a necessary. It's not a necessary evil. It's a necessary good. I, I do not want, I mean, I would rather live in, in, the, in the Czech Republic right now than under your vision of an open capitalism. I consider that one of the most horrific ideas in terms of human life ever. And, and if you read the history of it, it's exactly how it was. It was it was a horrific places to live. Go go read what life was like in Iceland, where, where David Friedman claims that there was this idyllic anarcho-capitalist society. It was it was horrible. People were slaughtering each other left and right. So no, I believe the state is a required, it is a necessary good because it is it, it does something that is required in civilization. Civilization requires the monopolization over the use of a territory force. If we leave every individual free to use force whenever they feel like it, whenever they want it, whenever the market dictates, what you have is nonstop violence and constant civil war. And that is one of the most horrific states to live in that one could imagine. So in order to bring peace, in order to make markets possible, capitalism is a marketplace. In order to create a marketplace, the first thing you have to do is extract force from the marketplace. And therefore, you can't have a marketplace in force. So you have to extract force from a marketplace, then you can have a market. And now we can trade. As long as force is embedded in the market, there is no market. The market is self-destructive. So the sequence of events is, first you need to extract force, and every place where you have a market, that's the first thing that's done, whether it legitimately or not legitimately, force is extracted, and then we can trade. But as long as force is embedded in it, then we're just, then we're just, I'm pulling a gun at you, and we're, 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 we're not trading anymore. Trade goes up. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question here, and then we can move to the quiet for a more informal discussion. So do we have, for the last question, do we have something anarchy and Bitcoin unrelated? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the equality again, uh, original topic. Yeah. Uh, I find it interesting. <laughs> Uh, that even the people who oppose the uh, uh, equality of outcome and say, okay, we don't want equality of outcome, but equality of opportunity, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Isn't it strange? Because when one thinks about it deeper, equality of opportunity is much worse. And you alluded to it you know, in the Cambodian example, rich city versus the countryside. So equality of opportunity actually means to make people equal in all respects. Even the same people, metaphysically in everything, they're just in one place and another place. Even that's, even that's uh, different opportunities. So people who say, okay, we're just for well, you know, opportunity. I think it's even worse that it requires our even more uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, more condemnation, more, more condemnation, yeah. stronger yeah. opposition. It's, it's, it's a more evil idea. I, I, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, all opportunity is is another outcome. And it's the kind of outcome that's not just monetary. It's about what gives you opportunities, which is how smart you are, how educated you are, how hard you work. Those, that's what creates opportunity. What else creates opportunity? Or how hard your parents worked. 
right? I mean, I work really hard to give my kids opportunities. And what you want to do by equating opportunities, taking that away from you. How do you do that? Well, I think the Cambodia's example is that. So opportunities is a kind of an outcome, a, a non-monetary outcome, and therefore even worse in terms of how to deal with it. The only way to deal with it is to really put us in chains or to kill us off. So, so absolutely. And, and, and the conservatives, every time they mouth in America, the conservatives always say, oh, no, no, we're, not, we're against equality of uh, outcome, but we're for equality of opportunity. They've lost the battle right there by saying that because that's exactly, that's exactly the case. Uh, uh, some parents work really hard to give their kids opportunity. Other parents don't. How do you equate those? Well, the only way is to really suppress the opportunities granted by the parents who work hard, who try to do it. Um, you know, it, 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 our kids can have different educations. Uh, they can have, yes. Now, what I'm concerned about is the opportunity set faced by people. I want to maximize opportunities. I want to maximize the number of opportunities that every individual on planet Earth has. And the way to maximize opportunities is to maximize freedom. The way to get people to have as many opportunities as possible is to maximize the freedom that's where they have the maximum economic opportunities. Whether they take advantage of them or not, their problem. But the opportunity will be there if we can um, if we can actually achieve liberty and achieve uh, achieve freedom. All right, thank you guys.